And joining us now from New York, New York, Lionel Tiger, professor of anthropology at Rutgers University and the co-author of God's Brain. Professor Tiger, it's good to have you on the program tonight. How are you? I'm very well so far. So far. It gets better. Relax. Uh, <laughs> let's start with this. What triggered your interest in studying why people believe in God? I wrote a book in 1979 called Optimism, the Biology of Hope, and I was fascinated by the manner in which people tend to overestimate the odds in their favor uh, virtually at all times. And it seemed to me that as a hunting-gathering species, which we are, we had to have built in a pattern so that we get up in the morning and say, what a great day to catch an elephant, <laughs> because whoever didn't do that would lie in bed or whatever they were, were on, mud floor or whatever, and they wouldn't have any dinner. The other element that introduced uh, the sort of semi-religious idea to me was uh, the Darwinian perspective, because Darwin's book on book and work on uh, sexual selection and natural selection meant that organisms had to make choices of partners and those choices became the species. And I put that together with the great zoologist George Bernard Shaw who once said, and you can use this for any sexual combination you wish, love consists in overestimating the difference between one woman and another. <laughs> and if, if you don't make that overestimate, there won't be a baby. And so I sort of put all these things together and then was very fortunate, having worked with him on other uh, uh, ways before, to get associated with Michael McGuire, who had been in the neuropsychiatric department, he was his chief at the UCLA Med School, who had discovered serotonin. And serotonin is the sort of feel-good uh, neurotransmitter, which has led to Prozac and everything else. And together we said, hey, let's see if we can try to explain this uh, miraculously complex and interesting and universal phenomenon called religion. In which case, as far as the brain is concerned, what function do you think religion plays? <clears throat> we assumed that uh, the brain creates religion. It's, the religion doesn't come out of the elbow or the ear or the, or the uh, shoulder. It comes out of the brain. It's an intricate cortical product. It's supported by books and preachers and theologians and uh, Talmudic disquisition, and it's employed by the brain. The brain is the organ that receives it, integrates it into the personality, and then into the social structure. Uh, the image we use, uh, I don't know if you had one, it was that toy of a bird with a beak at the edge of a glass which had water in it, and he would dip his beak into the water and then come back up sure. and dip back in. Well, I think religion is like that. It, it is something you dip into and then, my goodness, you sin, and then you have to dip into it again and so on. Uh, but it's a very interesting circular pattern. And the fact is that there are 4,200 uh, definable religions in the world, and uh, evidently at least 90% or maybe 85% of human beings are religious, and you have to explain why this is. And so we decided that being homo sapiens, after all, it was our sapient organ, the brain, which was the principal operator of this fascinating system. Well, I recently interviewed another professor from a country not Canada with the, uh, who had a book out with the word God in the title, except it was called The God Delusion, and it was Richard Dawkins. Now, he, of course, says that religion is irrational and, in fact, maybe uh, mentally delusional. What do you say to that? Well, look, I, 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 know, I know Richard for many, many years. I like him. I think he's a fine writer. Uh, he's done some very interesting work. On this, I think he's wrong because, uh, and I've been on panels with him where the discussion comes to, uh, so, Richard, would you say that most societies, nearly all societies, have religion? Yes, he will agree. And you're a naturalist, are you? Yes. In that case, is it possible religion is natural? And that's when the discussion ends. The fact is that the uh, corollary of what he says, and Christopher Hitchens and some other people who've written rather brilliantly and uh, energetically on the subject, is that if you're a religious person, you're somehow subnormal. 
Now, frankly, I can understand saying that when you get certain ideas like the trans uh, migration of souls or the, uh, uh, some of the belief in miracles and so on. Nonetheless, it's insulting to us, to our species, to our own integrity and dignity to say that what nearly all of us do is essentially moronic and unfortunate. No successful species can operate with 90% of its members uh, being foolish and wrong. Uh, well, he'd quibble with your 98%, but moving right along... 90%. 90%. Man, he'd quibble yes. with that. I think he says 15 to, tw 15 to 20 percent of people are acknowledged atheists in North America. But that's for another well, program. We won't worry about that. Let me quote Michael Brooks to you, the consultant for New Scientist magazine, because we've been going through tough economic times over the last couple of years, and he has this to say about the connection between religion and a hard economy. While many institutions collapsed during the Great Depression that began in 1929, one kind did rather well. During this leanest of times, the strictest, most authoritarian churches saw a surge in attendance. This anomaly was documented in the early 1970s, but only now is science beginning to tell us why. It turns out that human beings have a natural inclination for religious belief, especially during hard times. Our brains effortlessly, effortlessly conjure up an imaginary world of spirits, gods, and monsters, and the more insecure we feel, the harder it is to resist the pull of this supernatural world. It seems that our minds are finely tuned to believe in gods. Why do you think this is the case, particularly in difficult economic times? Because we're group animals, and uh, you can't live alone. No man is an island. And uh, humans have always been intensely social, intensely convivial, depend on, the, on each other, interested in each other, gossip with each other, groom each other, just hang out together. And religion is a mechanism such that you know at least once a week you can go to a place where there are people you know and trust, people who will help you out, who will help you build your house, raise your barn, do all those things. And uh, it's soothing. In, in our book, uh, God's Brain, uh, McGuire and I talk about two facets of this. The first is that we all suffer from what we call brain pain. You're getting a flat tire on, uh, during an important appointment that, uh, run that you're making. Your child is n not either obedient or clever. Uh, your uh, arrangements with your finances are very, very poor. And even if they're not, your brain is worried. It's worried. It's worried. And that's brain pain. On the other hand, uh, what religion does is provide what we call brain soothing. You go to a, a place, say Friday or Saturday or Sunday, it's often a rather elegant building, rather more elegant than where you live, and it may have beautiful music, it may have uh, official people with wonderful costumes, and whatever uh, the characteristics of it are, you feel at peace. And I can imagine, as happened during this last recession in, in, in this continent, that people needed some sense that there was a place they could go. You know, uh, there's that f uh, famous statement, was it from Thomas Wolfe, who said, home is where they have to take you in? Well, religions have to take you in. And if you're a, a Catholic or a, a Muslim or a Jew or whatever, and you're in a strange town, you go to the building of your flavor, and they will take you in. So uh, that, I think, is a relatively uncomplicated, rather sweet, convivial reason for religion. Doesn't mean you have to accept many of the strange assumptions of it or the fact that uh, things have happened which are otherwise inexplicable uh, unless a god or gods were involved. Nonetheless, I think it's uh, important to embrace intellectually, scientifically, if not emotionally, uh, something that's been so important to our species. Well, let me pick up on this brain-soothing notion that you have just advanced here. And I think if I read your book properly, you talk about three ways in which brain-soothing takes place, either through socialization, ritual, or belief. But you say it doesn't happen without effort. So what type of effort do you need to undertake in order for it to take place? Well, I, <clears throat> you have to go to Sunday school every Sunday. Right. That's for one thing. And secondly, you have to study something. You have a communion or a bar mitzvah, or you have some initiation which requires you to, to perform some act of acknowledgement that you're a member of that group. 
Uh, you have to attend the services uh, if, uh, as they are. Uh, you have to uh, perform certain rituals, uh, the sign of the cross, uh, avoiding certain foods on certain days or certain foods in general, uh, all of which mark you as a member of that religion. And uh, many people wear items on their bodies, amulets, crosses, stars of David, whatever, to reveal to themselves uh, and others who they are. And so that kind of intense identification, it seems to me, is something we can't be casual about. Now, that can become extraordinarily dangerous, as we see with the jihadist business of people who believe that the only decent way to serve one's God is for non-jihadi uh, people or non-Muslims to be killed. And people who've tried this, uh, this caper say that. It's a problem for the world now in a way that has probably not been as severe uh, since the Crusades. Okay, on most programs we do here, I like to quote either Groucho Marx or Karl Marx, and this feels like a Karl program, so let me, let me give you a, the old Karl Marx quote here, which, you know, religion is the opiate of the masses. What do you think of that one, given what you've written? I think that uh, religion is the sort of serotonin of the, uh, of the participating homo sapiens, that is, in that sense, Marx was right. Uh, the other Marx said at the same time famously, I don't want to be a member of a club that would have me as a member. <laughs> and that, that's what religions do. They, you are a member, and they all have you. And you have to be converted or you have to go through a certain procedure, as we've discussed. But between your two favorite Marxes, I think we begin to see something about uh, the, the gravity and the, the complexity of this process. And I suspect that having a, a better understanding of religion, uh, I'm here an optimist, may make us less willing to die for uh, a set of ideas and beliefs and practices which uh, may, after all, not be uh, uh, fatally essential to somebody. Okay. In our last minute here, before I invite you to join the others in the studio and in Points Beyond to continue our discussion, uh, let's go full circle. If belief is natural, as you have advanced during the course of our discussion tonight, is atheism an evolutionary exception in your view? You raise an extremely important question, and uh, McGuire and I, as we finished our book, we thought, well, you know, we left this out. At the same time, atheists are, and I know many, are people who have often very strong moral convictions. They may do, quote, unquote, good things, not because they read it in the Bible or the Koran, but they just intrinsically think that it's good to be good. And uh, at the same time, they often have a wider view of the world. Utilitarianism was one such view, namely the m best uh, result for the most people to make the most people happy. Utilitarianism as a, as a sort of religion substitute basically failed, I think, because it had lousy music and no good costumes. <laughs> uh, uh, and the other big effort to create a moral structure was uh, Karl's. Karl Marx's uh, epic, um, communism. But communism had a very poor theory of human nature, and finally people couldn't take it anymore. That's Lionel Tiger, the author of God's Brain. Stand by for a few seconds. I'm going to cross the studio, and we'll continue our discussion on whether environmentalism <coughs> is a new religion for today.